2006, and I'm at the Atlanta History Center with Mr. Ken Henson of Atlanta, Georgia. Mr. Henson has kindly agreed to come in and tell us about his experiences during World War II and some experiences before and since World War II. Uh, Mr. Henson, we really appreciate you taking the time to come in today. Could you state your full name and your current address, please? Full name is Kenneth E. Henson, H-E-N-S-O-N. I'm living in Sandy Springs, Georgia. And when and where were you born, Mr. Henson? I was born in northeastern Arkansas on a hill farm, raised on a farm. Um, started to go to college, and the war came along. Finished one year, and while I was at home during the summer, I knew I was going to be drafted. I talked to my parents and I said, I want to volunteer. No, oh, no, they wouldn't hear that. <laughs> they didn't want me to go anywhere. So they finally agreed to allow me to volunteer. <clears throat> so I went and volunteered and went into the uh, uh, as a book private. Now, what, was, year was, what year was this? That was in uh, November of 1943. Okay, and how old were you then? Uh, not, uh, God, that's correction, that was 1942. Okay. At that time, I was uh, 20. Okay. And I had my 21st birthday when I after went in. So, we went, I went to the, at that time, they called it the Air Corps. It was not the Air Force then. And I went in and volunteered, and, and when I finished all the paperwork, I went back home, and my draft notice was in the mailbox. So I just <laughs> barely missed it, which I wanted to do. And then uh, I went in, went to Keystone Field, Mississippi, and took all my basic training and so forth, and went to New Orleans, and started to be a, a hydraulic specialist. In the meantime, I did all the things that they required to become a cadet. And uh, I passed all of the things that were required, and uh, I was called to become a cadet in December of 1942. And then I had my flight training in 1943, and uh, in early 1945, I went to China after I had my combat training. Let's back up a little bit prior to your going into the service. Uh, describe the day in your life when Pearl Harbor was attacked. How you heard about it, what your feelings were. I, there was rumors of something was about to happen, but. I really didn't uh, put too much emphasis on it, and it was on Sunday, of course, and I had gone to church with a bunch of the youngsters that I ran around with, and when we got back, the radio was on and telling about the Japanese attacking Pearl Harbor. And, of course, <clears throat> I, was, I was astonished, really. And so I, uh, I knew that I was a prime target for going in service because of my age. And so when I uh, finished up that year of going to school, I went home and just really took the summer off and then volunteered for going in the Air Corps. Okay. Now, when you were being trained in the Air Corps, were you with individuals from your home area or just all different individuals? No, it was just people from everywhere all over the country. What was that experience like? Well, it was a little bit different than I had been used to because discipline started setting in real quick. And I got, it wasn't so bad when I was in basic training as a, uh, not an officer, not a cadet. And then when I got into cadets, things started picking up and they required strict 
participate. You did what you're supposed to do when it's supposed to do it. And if you didn't, you usually got some blocking marks against you. <laughs> Were the members of your training class subsequently members of your crew? Did they follow you or you follow them? No. They, when we, I went to Salt Lake City after I'd finished my <clears throat> training to learn to fly a heavy bomber, B-24. And there they assembled the crew members. Okay. And I don't know how they assigned who to what. But anyway, I was assigned uh, 11, correction, 9 crew members because I was the 10th one. Now, when you finished that train, what had you been trained to do specifically? Well, I was trained to, first of all, uh, I went through flight training, just I had never been in an airplane, never been on an airplane. I was able to do that and finished and graduated, and then they said, you've got, we're going to assign you to heavy bombers. I wanted fighters. Everybody wanted fighters anyway. That was the thing that was glamorous. So, I... Uh, I didn't. Uh, I was assigned to heavy bombers. I went to Montgomery, Alabama. That was the base where they trained people to learn to fly the B-24. Mm -hmm. And I got through that all right. And then they sent me to Salt Lake City and assembled the crew. And then we went to Boise, Idaho. And there we took our combat training, doing all the things that we would do normally in combat. We're flying long missions, missions at night. We uh, had all kinds of training with weapons, machine guns, so forth, and how to take care of the weapons and that sort of thing. Did your group lose any planes in training? Yes, when I was a cadet, we did. We lost. Uh, I guess out of my class, which was 43J, I guess we lost uh, probably 12, 15, mm -hmm. and it was usually uh, because they had disobeyed safety mm -hmm. regulations. What kind of friendships did you form in training or bonds? Well, it's amazing. <clears throat> You know, and uh, it was about seven months that we were together in the cadet training. And uh, we were usually the class stayed together, 43J. It was, and when we went through the training together and we had to do all of this thing that was type discipline, we uh, helped one another, formed close friendships, although we knew that most likely when the training was over, we wouldn't see anyone mm -hmm. again because each people, or these people went different ways, different types of aircraft to fly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kept in contact with some of them, uh, still do today. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but uh, you find that the closest friendships are formed when you are a crew. Mm -hmm. And when we were in combat training in Boise, we had to do a, a lot of things uh, that really drew us together. Yeah. And we had to learn to trust each other. We watched each other as they trained. And the rest of the crew watched me as uh, I was flying the aircraft in different conditions. And so it was a time of getting to know each other. It was a time when we saw that we could trust mm -hmm. the other man or the other people in the yeah. crew because we knew that we had to do that when we got into combat. Yeah. Right. Where did you go after you left Boise? After I left Boise, I went to Topeka, Kansas. That was the place where you left from usually okay. to go wherever in combat. Yeah. We didn't know where we were going when we went to Topeka. We got all the materials that we needed, uh, combat uh, clothing, that sort of thing. And 
then we got or put on an airplane and said, you're going to Miami, Florida. But they still didn't tell us where we were going. Huh. Simply because they were fearful that somebody would say something mm -hmm. and uh, you never knew who was listening and who yeah. was an enemy. So they didn't want it out. Yeah. And we went to Miami and from there we flew on uh, the transports provided by the Air Corps, went down the east coast of South America and across the South Pacific uh, by Ascension Island, flew across the Sahara Desert. That was quite an experience. Yeah. Because those airplanes weren't pressurized, nor were they air conditioned. So, so it was so hot. Oh, <laughs> so we saw a lot of the Sahara Desert that was hot and dry, but we saw a lot of animals and, really? and all kinds of things that we wouldn't have seen. We went on and went into Karachi, India, and spent a couple of weeks there. We went up to a base at the foot of the mountains where, uh, what's the tallest mountain? I can't, I this is off the wall. I lost it for a minute. But anyway, Kilimanjaro. We, huh? Kilimanjaro? No. No, we'll get it right. But anyway, it's the tallest mountain in the world, right over there, close by. Yeah. And we spent a week or two there waiting to get across the hump, they call it, which was just south of this mountain and into China. And that was in May of 1943. 44, 44, May of 1944. And we got there in May. I flew my first mission with another crew that had been over there flying uh, missions uh, in May. I think it was May, uh, correction, it was June the 4th. I flew my first mission. Mount Everest. Yeah, right. Yeah. Or why you lose those things in that Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> But that's, that's quite a mountain to fly by. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, that's 29,000 feet up in the area. B-24 didn't get much higher than about 24,000. Mm -hmm. So when we flew across there on a transport, we went by and looked up and seen that peak way above us. Mm -hmm. It was quite a thrill. Yeah, I bet. And then I, and when I was over there, I flew a lot of trips over the hump back to India just to pick up fuel or ammunition between our missions. And then we'd fly back and take it back to China. So we'd fly another mission. When did you first find out where you were going? We found out when we got to Miami. Okay. What was your feeling when you found out? Well, kind of elated. I didn't mm -hmm. realize that I'd ever have the opportunity to be flying with a flying tiger yeah. and with such a man as General Chenault. Yeah. I had the opportunity to talk to him, play softball with him. Well, tell us about that experience. Well, we had a, several bases around there, and we had teams that would play each other. And he played the one, the major, our headquarters for the 14th Air Force was in Kunming, which was about 10, 12 miles from us where our base was. And our base was down on the lake. About 10, 12 miles east of Kunming. But anyway, to get back to the softball games, we'd go around and travel around different bases and play them when we were off. And uh, he came down and played us. I don't know where we won or lost. <laughs> it was a thrill to be able to, you know, be a random man like yeah. that because know him so well. What was he like? He was a man that, uh, he was, uh, You'd think he was stern, but he, he wasn't really. He was easy to get to know and easy to talk to. Where specifically were you stationed out of once you got there? Uh, in China. It, it was called, it was uh, given the name of Dog Baker. Okay. That was the okay. base okay. they gave us. Tell us now your experiences once you got there, your, your, your missions, your more memorable missions, what you did, what you saw, what you experienced.
Sure, that'd be fine. Uh, I uh, I had several missions that was very uh, well challenging. I guess I would have to say. Um, I uh, I'd started off with these that I had written up about flying across the hump. Yeah. And my uh, squadron commander was Colonel Harvard Powell. And uh, he wanted to fly with me over to India to pick up supplies. And he wanted to fly the airplane, so that was fine. And uh, as we were flying across the hump toward India, one of our engines quit. Well, we went through the procedure of shutting it down and feathering the engine and then looking over everything. And during that time that we checked everything, I found that the ignition switch was on. The ignition switch was, I was flying in the co-pilot seat, and if you twist around a little bit, you get to me once you would cut it off. So, I was thinking, well, what a pickle am I in here? I got my commanding officer and I don't have enough sense to not keep my knee off of the <laughs> ignition switch. So we wasn't very far from India anyhow, so he wanted to change seats. And I wasn't absolutely certain, I'm sure I am in my own mind, that I turned it off. But so we got on the ground and they checked the engine, it was okay, so we got back with no problem. And uh, then uh, the uh, other thing that this comes to my mind was I flew several missions. We had our missions, a lot of them were single plane missions. We would bomb a target all night with a single plane coming over about every 30 minutes bombing the target. Other times we would have a whole uh, uh, Air Force effort over there. And this one that I'll talk, I'll talk about a little bit later was with that type of a mission. So <clears throat> We uh, usually had missions that uh, was uh, really made sense in trying to carry them out. Uh, the, I remember one mission I flew, it was a three-plane daylight mission into what is now Vietnam and at that time was French Indochina. And we went down there to bomb railroad bridges, and it was a low altitude type mission. We were 500 feet most of the time, and then we go lower when we go over a target because we didn't want that bomb to go down and hit the, the bridge and come back up on oh, the airplane. Yeah. So we were down there, and this uh, Major Carswell was leading the three airplanes, and he was flying at uh, 500 feet and less, and you got three planes in formation. That low plane in there, you're scraping the trees a little bit. So uh, it was quite thrilling yeah. when you had that happening. But uh, we were shot out a lot by the Japanese, but fortunately none of us got wounded. So we finished the mission and started back and ran into weather and we had to break up the three planes. And I thought I knew the area around our home base. And I went up a valley and it wasn't. And the, and the terrain was coming up fast so I had to get the airplane going and climbed out, out over the mountains. It was all around us. Went over in the next valley, and there was our home base. So we made it back with no problems. Now the next uh, mission that I want to talk about is it was in the late summer of 1944. The total air force in our air corps at that time in China was going on this mission. It was a mission to try to knock out this Japanese naval base, which was in the South China Sea. And it was about 400 miles off the coast. It, it was right by the way, the same base 
that uh, the Chinese forced one of our planes down not long ago. Oh, in, yeah. Hey, then, uh, yeah. So uh, we uh, were assembled for that, and we had our briefings at the various uh, squadron uh, play, uh, locations. And when our briefer briefed us, he was telling us about the terrain and the base and so forth. We were going to be flying in a huge formation of airplanes. And, uh, they told us about the terrain we'd be flying over. They told us about uh, if we had uh, a problem when we had finished our mission and was headed back, which I didn't know that I at that time would have any problem. But I paid attention, pretty close attention, because I had been advised when we assembled that I did not have my regular navigator. He had gotten sick. And uh, I had a new navigator that uh, had never been on a mission. And naturally, he was uptight. So uh, when I found that out, I listened, I listened very carefully to all the information that they were giving out. And we were told that we were going to be flying over a base, a fighter base, a forward fighter base, close to the Japanese lines. And uh, that was a base that we could land at if we had problems with our airplane during being shot up or whatever, or maybe people killed. And then we went on, and as we got closer to the target, I was watching very carefully the headings I was flying, and when we got fairly close to Hainal Island, the zeros just swarmed around us. And, uh, but we continued on our mission, got on our bombing run, and one of the airplanes came through the large group of airplanes and how he kept from hitting an airplane, I don't know, but he didn't. But he was able to disable the engine I showed you in the picture. And uh, we finished the bombing run, we made a left turn out, came back over a small island, and there's the anti-aircraft battery on that, and that battery shot out another engine. And that left us with only two engines, and uh, the rest of the group was moving on at normal speed. I couldn't stay up with just two engines, half of my power was gone. So the Jet Zeros, and, and I don't know what other type of airplanes they had, but they were raking us over pretty good with their small cannons. Uh, nose to tail and wingtip to wingtip. And uh, by the way, when we got back, the people who repaired their airplane said they found one live shell, nine millimeter cannon shell, that didn't explode. It was in my fuel tank. They were shooting the wings up, so they knew that we carried the, the fuel in there. And so, uh, if that had exploded, we would have lost a wing and we would have never made it back. God. But finally, they ran out of fuel and we had to, to uh, then get on with trying to get that airplane back to a safe landing on a forward base. So, first of all, we knew we did not have a, a hydraulic system that was disabled. We knew we, without disabled, we had no way of uh, extending our gear, landing gear, in a normal manner. We had to do it by uh, emergency means. We weren't sure, but we didn't think we had any brakes. So we were in bad shape there as far as landing on a dirt strip covered in grass, and it was a very short strip. And uh, <clears throat> we were told during the briefing that morning that this particular Air Force forward base, air base, had a strong homing beacon, a radio beacon that put out a constant signal and you tune the frequency in and your, what we call an automatic direction finder would point. So when we got away from the airplanes, I tuned that in and uh, needle, well, I was, I was, had enough 
brain power to watch what the heading we were flying in, so I knew what we had to fly out to get back to where we needed to where we needed to go. So uh, I was holding that heading. We tuned the horn beacon in. It was pointing ahead. Then I called the inexperienced navigator and I asked him, I said, young fellow, I need a, a heading to this base. And I said, we flew over it and you may have seen it when we came over. And there was a pause and he said, Captain, he said, I don't know which way is up. I'm so scared I can't, I can't give you a heading. So we had been flying at about uh, 21,000 feet, I think, on the mission and dropping the bombs. So we had enough altitude to let down a little bit, and we did. We lost altitude, but on the coast of China, getting back, we had a range of mountains that was uh, 7,000 foot elevation, so we couldn't go more than 8,000. We also threw everything loose that we had on board out so we could lighten, uh, you know, lighten the airplane, but I, I don't think it helped any, yeah. but at least we tried. And so we had a few minutes to think about the, the situation we were in, and we uh, talked about how we were going to get the gear down and what type of approach we would make in for this fighter field. And, in the meantime, we had gotten to the altitude that we couldn't go any lower, and the airplane was just barely flying. It was uh, stalling a little bit, and then it would drop a little bit, and then it would catch on. And we flew that for, I guess, an hour and a half like that, just barely on the edge of keeping it in the air. And But the corner was still pointing ahead, and we was holding our heading. So when we crossed the... Um, shoreline, we got over the mountains, we started letting down again to what we thought we ought to be to land. The uh, airport came into view, the pointer was still painting, uh, pointing a bit ahead. We started calling the tower and we'd been given the frequency and nobody answered. So we had to make up our mind which way we wanted to land. We circled the field once in a descent. In the meantime, we were using that time to get our gear down by emergency means. And uh, we knew uh, I knew I didn't have any help with my uh, flying. Of course, it was always stiff anyway. So as we crossed the field the first time, I noticed the pointer swung. And that gave us encouragement. We knew we were at the right field. Sometimes people landed at jet bases. So we turned around and we came down. We had the gear down. We made our approach, lined up on the grass strip, set it down on the very end. And the minute that we got the nose on the ground, I put the brakes on. Didn't want to release them because I figured if we had some pressure, if we kept the pressure on, it could stop it, and then we could release it. We was able to stop the airplane before we got to the end of the runway, which had a river. We turned around and moved in to a parking area and cut the engines off. The commander of the base came up, and we were talking to him, and as we were going back to base headquarters, and I told him, I said, uh, I think he was a colonel, I said, I appreciate you keeping the beacon operating that we were able to find you. He looked at me and then he said, Beacon? I said, what beacon? And I said, well, we were advised that there was a strong beacon here that helped us to find you if we needed to. And he said, son, that thing hadn't been operating in months. The Japanese shouted out. Now, that gets your attention. I have wow. to say, the Lord kept that thing going. Sure so like as we swung around, made the approach, got on the ground, we were all very uh, elated to be able to get on the ground. None of us, by the way, got hit by bullets again. Yeah. All was okay. And then the last <coughs> mission I well, Before we go to the next mission, 
you brought a picture of your plane as it was yeah. trying to get back. Uh, I'd like to get that on the video if we could. All right. As you look back on that day when you were trying to get back, what were your emotions? Fear or just what? Well, my emotions were not necessarily fear. I was just concerned that we needed, we wanted to get back safely. I mean, uh, and I know that uh, the Lord had something to do with this, be able to get me back yeah. and the crew back and that pointer to be pointing straight ahead. Wow. So I, you would have to, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't say that I was full of fear, but I was concerned if we were going to make it die here because, you know, that type of situation, if you had another engine to quit on you, that would have been it. Yeah. Definitely you wouldn't, wouldn't have gotten by it. Gosh. So, well, you were obviously a skilled pilot to be able to get that back. <laughs> well, I didn't, didn't regard myself as a skilled pilot. I was just trying to save my neck and my crew. So the next one I uh, want to talk to you about is the last one I'll bring up as far as my experiences in China. My last uh, mission was assigned to me just before we were going to go home, and it was in December. And uh, we were assigned the duty to go and lay uh, mines. There were mines that usually was put out by boats. Uh, the Japanese carrier, a big cruiser, had been running from the Admiral Halsey's Navy. They were chasing the Japanese boats all over the Pacific. And this boat went into Hong Kong Harbor, and went in to the Kowloon docks and docked. Turned off everything, all, all the lights, everything. And one of our, our spy planes saw it. And they wanted us to bottle the ship up in the harbor. So we were assigned the duty to go and drop, I believe, four mines from a 50 foot altitude at night. <laughs> and we were told that the weather was going to be good and there'd be moonlight. We already knew that the Hong Kong Harbor was full of these cone-shaped rocks sticking up out of the water. So we get everything set. We had to have the bomb bays changed a little bit to get these mines in there. We had a radio altimeter on board the aircraft, which was very accurate, and we could maintain the 50-foot altitude. So we got there and we let down out over the ocean. And lo and behold, along the coast was clouds, cloud deck. So we chose to go under the cloud deck, and everybody on the airplane was given orders to watch for those cone-shaped rocks, mm -hmm. tell us which way to turn to miss them. And uh, we got down to 50 feet, maneuvered and got in close to the cruiser, dropped her mines, pulled out, and the crew was so elated that everybody on that airplane was firing their guns at slam pans and so forth. <laughs> so I asked my navigator, the old, my old navigator was on board that night, and I said, how about getting me a heading back home? So he did. I didn't hear from him for about an hour. I called him and I said, uh, what about, how are we doing here? I said, are we going to have enough fuel to get back? And he made some shots on the stars. He said, I have to tell you, I went to sleep after that <laughs> mission. And he said, we're not much closer to home now than we were an hour ago. He said, we've run into some strong headwinds. You know, you better get to working here because we got to know if we're going to make it, we may have to land at some forward base for fuel. So 
we did that. Kept watch on our fuel. And when we got close enough to the our home base, we called them and told them that we needed to fly and land straight in clear the traffic pattern. Of course, this was still at night. And uh, so they did. We landed straight in and one of the engines stopped running just as soon as we got on the ground. That was how close we almost used up all our fuel. How did you handle the two navigators, one, one that fell asleep and one that got so scared he couldn't tell you where he where you were. What did, what did you well, do after those missions? I just told him that uh, I understood that a young man had come in and had not been on any missions. And him being a, a person that had not been exposed to, you know, flying on combat conditions, I said, uh, I would uh, advise you to be able to get a hold of your mm -hmm. emotions. The other one, who had been so faithful and had done a good job, that was our last mission. So it would have not done any good to have gotten a hassle with him. Yeah. So I just let it go on him. We went on home in about a month. So why was this your last mission? We, uh, <clears throat> we were not supposed to fly more than 50 missions. Oh, okay. We, this was our 53rd mission. So that completed our the requirement of getting uh, getting our missions over and being able to go home. So when did you go home? We went home uh, the first part of these uh, first part of January. I don't remember the exact date. And then of nineteen forty. Forty-five. It would be forty-five because yeah. forty-four is when we went right. over there. Okay. Forty-five. Okay. Forty-five. And did you, once you came home, did you stay stateside? You didn't go back overseas. Well, no uh, we knew that uh, the rumors was out that Germany had already folded, mm -hmm. and they were fighting the Japanese, and. Uh, we had heard, I don't know how it leaked out, but we had heard that there's going to be some bombs dropped, we didn't know what kind, on Japan, but we probably end the war. And at that time, I was in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, I was getting ready to uh, instruct uh, young men in the B-24, but with everything that was going on, things were kind of slowing down. So uh, while we were there in Nashville and instructing these young men, uh, we heard about the bomb being dropped. We were very elated, elated because we felt like that, that, that that would end the war. Had you, given, had you been given any indication that you'd be involved in the invasion of Japan if the war didn't end? No, no one had said that. <clears throat> but uh, it wouldn't have surprised me because had the war continued in the same, uh, shall I say, the same type of hard uh, fighting that we had been engaged in before, it would have been a tough fight over that to have been. Those people would have fought to the death. Yeah. So the nuclear bomb saved a lot of lives, even though it killed a lot of children. Sure yes. You brought some pictures with you. I'd like to get, number one, show the picture of uh, General Chenault, okay. your, your softball co there. cohort. I'll turn this up. Okay. Is that good enough? That's great. And you also brought pictures of your crew and of yourself. Could we get a pic? See one of the pictures of you and your uniform and, and of the crew. See me. And could we see a picture of the, the crew? Okay. 
Okay. Did you ever lose any crew members? No. We all came home very right. safely. This is the airplane we flew in combat that got back after our mission to uh -huh. Hainan Island. Uh -huh. So we were war weary veterans. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt about that. Okay, thank you. Did you have a feeling while you were in the service that you were part of one of the most significant significant events, definitely in the United States history, but also in world history? Well, I, I had some feeling that this was a war, and they had said it's a war that went in all wars. But they said that about World War One. Yeah, and uh, it was. Uh, it was a time of, uh, you know, our country had been really had been through tough times, and we had given up a lot of things that normally we used to having, and the American people really came through in that. They supported our troops wherever they were. They, uh, when the people came home from the battles, they honored them with just telling them they th they thanked them for what they yeah. did. And uh, I would have thought that this would be a war to end all wars because there was a lot of people killed. Mm -hmm. But apparently we didn't learn. Yeah, never do. <laughs> you were uh, very highly decorated, uh, and you brought one particular document with you that you were given by the Chinese. Would you tell us about that? And I'd also like to get it on the okay. uh, video. Well, I had no idea that this was coming. Uh, I, I was already back in the States and uh, had uh, started my second career as an instructor. And uh, this came in the mail. And I'll just put this up here first. This was a certificate of award from Chiang Kai-shek. And it was the breast Order of Yan Hui with ribbon hmm. from the Chinese government at that time. Okay. okay. And along with it, they sent their appreciations for us being over there and fighting for them. And I can't read a word of it. <laughs> but you know it's good. Yeah. Well, that's beautiful. Thank you. When you were in China, did you ever have the opportunity to interact with the Chinese people? Not too much. They, uh, we were, you know, for some reason, the communist movement had started when you didn't realize it, how much. But the communist movement had started in China while we were there. Mm -hmm. And when we went over there, we usually go into a little town of Kunming, and the Chinese people would be along the sides of the road, and we were riding in jeeps. And they would uh, they would stand by the side of the road with their thumb up and say, Ding Hao, um, um, good, yeah, good. Yeah. And there toward the end, before even before I left, when I would go into town for anything, you'd be telling boo how, boo how. That's how quick the communists changed those people. Oh, really? Wow. Huh. That's interesting. <laughs> so when did you get out of the service? I got out of the service in, uh, I believe, December. No, I got out in uh, June, okay. 1945. Okay. Well, that's wrong. That's October 1945. I got out. October 45. October 45. Okay. 
one fact I'd like to get on the or two facts actually that we haven't covered. One is what unit were you in? What or squadron or what specific uh, group were you in? I was in, of course, 14th Air Force, mm -hmm. the, the 308th Bomb Group. And I've got it on there, I think, in the 374th okay. Squadron. Okay. And, okay. Uh, I think that covers what we got there. Yeah. Okay. And one other item, uh, what is your date of birth? 12 10 21. December the 10th, 1921. And what did you do after you got out of the service? Well, I, uh, I at, that, at that point in time, I had made up my mind that I was still with flying. I just didn't want to have anything to do with airplanes. Yeah. So I uh, was able to get a job with General Motors in their body plant in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And um, they was getting ready to groom me to go into management, and I wasn't sure I wanted to do that. So about that time, Eastern Airlines had a representative come through St. Louis and uh, hiring people, hiring pilots. So I went down and interviewed them, huh. and they hired me. Wow. So I went to work for Eastern Airlines. And flew with him 35 years. Oh, well, congratulations. Looking back on your experiences, when were you the most scared of any time? I think I was the most scared before I got there. I had all of these things conjured mm -hmm. in my mind. What if this and what if that? And what if I get shot down or what if I get wounded? Yeah. You know, all those things. But once I got over there, I was concerned when we were flying missions, but at the same time, I didn't have time to dwell on those things when you're in combat. You were there to do a job and, and uh, the best you can, and that's what I did. Do you keep up with any of your former crew members? Yes. I've got uh, one crew member that lives in Philadelphia. I haven't heard from him now in over a year, and I think maybe he may not be living, but I've got to find out. This past um, two weeks ago, I went down to Macon, Georgia, and met one of the men that I, you know, another crew that I had flown with in China. And he's an artist now. I can believe it or not, he became an artist at 74 years old. And he was on the mission that I almost got shot down. He was an airplane also above me. And he painted a picture of that. Gee. And uh, I was able to go down and see it. It's in the museum down at Macon, Georgia. Oh, gosh. Warner Robbins. Did you ever go down there? Yes. Yeah, so, There's a fine aircraft museum down there. Yeah, I, I want to go there and see that. Mr. Henson, is there anything else you would like to share with us about your experiences, your experiences during the war or before or after? Well, I'd just like to say that my background, raised on a farm, there wasn't an airport in 100 miles in it. <laughs> I was raised. <laughs> and I would be out in the fields doing something and I'd hear one of these old World War I airplanes come on. Double wing airplane, they, they didn't fly very high. They were flying all over the country, you know, and uh, they give people rides. Uh, charge them, I think, ten dollars a piece. I didn't have ten dollars, so I couldn't ride. But I went and looked at those airplanes and looked at the pilots, and that's what I wanted to be. I had an aunt that gave me the life of Lindbergh. I read that book. Boy, that fired me up, and I wanted to fly. But I had no idea that I would ever fly simply because of where I lived and so forth. And when the war came along and I got an opportunity to fly, it made the opportunity come alive. Hmm. Learned to fly, and it gave me my life's yeah. work when I got back. Well, I
I can't tell you how much I personally appreciate, and I'm sure the Atlanta History Center appreciates your sharing your story. You're a, you're a real hero, and well, uh, you, I don't regard that myself as that. I just did what I was told and what was expected of me, and it came out fine. Well, we we appreciate what you did for the country. Yeah. You know, I love this country. I want to see it continue. We don't know what we got. You're right. We got the freedoms.